Imagine with me. You're planning to build a home, right? You have access to the man who invented the concept of building homes. He knows everything about doing this. He knows everything about building the home. He knows how to build it just right. He knows how to make it where it's gonna last. You have this access. However, you decide that you wanna go at it your own way. You wanna go at it alone. <laughs> you have your own ideas on how the home needs to be built and what it should look like. You forgo his blueprints and tools and have decided to use different materials than what the man says was required. And now you believe yourself to be ready to start the construction. But as you begin to build, you realize that the foundation is not level. The walls are crooked. You try to fix the problem, but it just keeps getting worse. No matter how hard you try to correct course, nothing seems to work. Eventually, the home collapses and all your hard work is ruined. In the story, there is a desired outcome. There are instructions, there are materials, and there is even assistance available to guide the person to the desired outcome. It will require hard work, it will require going through challenges, but the man will help the person get to the desired outcome if they utilize the help that is available. But the person refuses the help and ends up feeling empty and hopeless in the end. This is what happens so often when you and I, when people attempt to build their Christian homes. They gather the equipment to build and begin the work only to realize that there is a certain way that God reveals through the word of God that we know the Bible to build the Christian home and doing it other ways causes much pain and it leads to the opposite of the desired outcome. And we feel empty. We feel broken and we feel helpless. Some might even say hopeless. Allison and I went through this early in our marriage. We wanted a Christian home, but we attempted building it our own way. We didn't do everything wrong, but we definitely caused ourselves a lot of headaches that weren't necessarily necessary. It wasn't until years later that we submitted to the fact that the Bible has clear instructions on what our desired outcome should be and how to get to the desired outcome, and that we have the assistance of God Almighty who is cheering us on as we go towards that outcome. Today is our second Sunday in our sermon series, Beautiful Mess, where we're going to discuss anything and everything family. Nothing's off limits. Why? Because it's enough that we keep letting the world tell us, let's find out what does God's word say about how we can have not just a mess, but a beautiful mess. A beautiful mess that God will look down and say, I am pleased with your worship of me. I am pleased with how you are building your Christian home. There's no such thing as a perfect family. Family done right is a beautiful mess, and that is okay. And regardless of how messed up you and I are, God loves us, and he has plans to use us to accomplish his will on earth. You can't mess up enough to mess up God's plans. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> I've tried. <clears throat> we all know that the family is the most fundamental unit of society. We see it in our own country. We see it in other countries. It's where we learn our values. It's where we learn our beliefs. It's where we learn our morals. Therefore, it's crucial that we aim for the right thing in our families. Why? So that we can build a strong foundation for our children and for our future generations. What you do today will affect your generations after. One of the focuses, one of my hopes, one of my goals in this ministry serving here is not just to see lives changed, but to see legacies changed. I don't want to just see one person's life changed. I want to see people that are attached to that person's life changed for the gospel, who people look at them and said, they'll never get out of that addiction. They'll, they'll never get out of that lifestyle. They'll never get off the streets. 
They'll never learn how to spend appropriately. They'll never. I want to see those stories. Why? Because those stories attract other broken people who are looking for hope. And it starts with the family. It starts with the home. Some of you are saying, you know, I'm widowed, or I don't have children, or I don't have that. You still have a home, and God wants it to be a Christian home. Amen? Amen. And so what we've got to do is we need to pre-decide what we want to build and why we want to build it. And then make sure that the decisions we make line up with our desired outcome. If we don't do that, we'll find ourselves in some, some trouble. I don't know if you have, but I know I have. And so this brings us to the big idea of the day, sermon. In order to build a Christian home, you must be clear on what the Bible says that a Christian home is and is not. And understand why God says you are to build one so that as you build, you don't get distracted and accidentally build something else. And if you've ever gotten one of those things in the mail, you know, something like Ikea, when I order some things from Amazon, I always want to check the reviews on how hard was it to make, right? I'm glad that it lasts. How hard was it to put together? And so when the stuff comes and the directions gives you pictures with no words and you're looking at this and you're hoping to build a bookshelf and instead somehow you built a, back, a, a bed frame, you know? It's like, how in the world am I to put this, 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 this together and come up with a picture that is on this box? If we know what we're to build and why we're to build it, we're much more likely to stay on course during the build. I want to remind you, though, that the devil, the world, and your flesh, and what it wants are real things. They're real temptations. They love to work together. They love to do everything possible to tempt you to get off course and end up somewhere you never wanted to be with a product you never desired to make. Many homes today are being pulled in all kinds of directions. Some homes are focused on business success. Others are focused on the life and the leisure of vacationing. Others are focused entirely on academic achievements. Others are focused on having the most toys. Others are focused on athletic achievements. Others are focused on being known as the most religious. And other poor souls are focused on all of the above. They're trying to do it all. And yet at the end of the day, they oftentimes feel empty and unsuccessful as a family because it's exhausting to try to do everything. So when they're trying to build a Christian home, but in fact, what they end up building is uh, something like the pictures up here. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. It's like, a, like someone tried to make a s'more out of that. Um, interesting architecture it is. What about another one? Yeah. Some of you are like, oh, that's kind of cool. Man, it, like to me, I'm like, if, if, a, if we had a hurricane, if we had just a 40 mile, like, I'm worried about that house. And so often that's what happens is we're all going in different directions. Our house is pointing in this way when in fact it's supposed to look like a home. It just, it's, it's just being pulled everywhere. And what happens is if a storm comes and hits that house, what's going to happen? It's not going to make it. We know that to be true. We've seen what storms can do. Oftentimes when a family is building a Christian home, each member of it has their own thoughts of what that looks like and how to arrive at that destination. And this ends up having the home being pulled in all those directions that we're talking about. The truth is that all the things I mentioned are bad in and of themselves, but many times these things become the distractions that keep us from experiencing the joy and the fullness of what a Christian home is to be like. We end up putting these things before God himself, and when we do that, it hurts, doesn't it? But let me also be clear, because I recognize the majority of you are like me. You're not building a Christian home. You're remodeling a Christian home, right? You, you've been at work, and now you're like, oh, we need to make some adjustments. And so that's okay, because here's the thing. No matter how bad you think your home is, God can restore it. And not God can just restore it. God can breathe new life into your Christian home. One of the best things that Allison and I ever did was we brought in what we call family worship. And so every night we pray, most nights we read the Word of God. This year we've been reading through the New Testament. And so we're, we're in John, I want to say 9, is that right, Joshua? John, John 9? 
Yeah, I think we might have read that yesterday. So maybe John 10. And so we're reading through the New Testament together. We talk, we answer questions, and we pray together. I do it in the morning before school, and then we do it together as a family at night before bed. And, and I'm not saying that the brag. I'm saying that God's word is powerful. It brings conversations that otherwise we wouldn't have. And it changes our family, and it changes our life. It changes the direction. Not only does it change it, it puts all of us on the same page. But we weren't always like that. And we don't always get it right. It's a beautiful mess. But it's a mess headed in the same direction. Amen? The first question that you need to ask and answer is this. What kind of home do you want your home to become? What kind of home do you want your home to become? Before someone builds a home, they make out a what? Blueprint. 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 There we go. Oh, you were raising your hand. I didn't even see your hand. I'm sorry, man. A blueprint. You got to have the blueprint. What, 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 would, what would God's design for the blueprint be for a Christian home? Here's what I believe from my reading of Scripture is that you should want your home to be a home that is known for, and if you have your notes, your listening guy, that is known for loving God above all else and loving others as Jesus has loved you. We don't need to make it too complicated, because if we make it too complicated, we lose direction of what in the world we were trying to build to begin with, right? This is the picture on the box, that we want our home to be known as a home that is loving God above all else, and loving others as Jesus has loved you and I. If our home focuses on those two things, we will experience the fullness of what it means to be a Christian home. Look with me at one of the most popular and memorized passages of Scripture in the Old Testament. This is, by hands down, the most important passage to the Jewish people. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your Soul, I want y'all to participate with all your strength. These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. So sitting, walking, lying, getting up. All four of those things covers all areas of life. That's why that's there. And so what it's saying is, is talk about these things always. When you're sitting, when you're lying, when you're getting up, when you're, just always talk about these things. That's what God's telling his people. But then he goes on and says, bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your city gates. <coughs> Saturate your home with loving God. His word. Not knowing God and His word, loving. There are a lot of people who know a lot about God. They know a lot about the Bible. They can quote me the Bible, but I cannot see the Bible in their lives. They're so quick to point on everybody else's problems, and yet they ignore all of their own. I've been there. It's not very pretty. It's not a beautiful mess. It's just a mess. And so what we need to remember is is that God said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And he knew that it was difficult to hold on to this, and so he said, don't let this out of your sight. But it wasn't just the God of the Old Testament said this. The God of the New Testament, which is still the same God, Jesus Christ said this as well. Mark 12, 28 through 34, it's on your screen. It says, one of the scribes approached when he heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which command is the most important of all? And so anytime you see a Pharisee, a religious leader, or a scribe coming to Jesus, their intention is not good when it comes to asking the question. Except for Nicodemus. In John 3, that's good. But normally, most of the time, when they come to him, they ask a question because they're desiring to trip him up. They're desiring to get him to say something so they can arrest him, so that they can get him and shut him up. That's their whole goal, right? And so they come up with this question. Which is the most important? I love what he <laughs> Jesus is awesome. Can we just agree about that? 
He answered, the most important is listen, Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Did, did we just read this in Deuteronomy? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's the most important. But then he says the second is love your neighbor as yourself. And then he goes on and says there is no other command greater than these. If we focus our home on loving God and loving others, we won't be so focused on what we don't have. We won't be so focused on putting our hope in our government or putting our hope in politicians or putting our hope in, in actors and actresses and musicians and all these people who say that they have the answers. They don't have the answers. They didn't create the world. I want to know the one who has the answers who created everything. I want to know the one who sent his son to die for me to pay, to pay the price of my sin. Love God with everything and love others as yourself, but not just as yourself. Look, look what he goes on. And the scribe said to him, you're right, teacher. You have correctly said that he is one and there is no one else except him. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Before you say we're going to read the Bible, before you say we're going to pray, before you do all of these things, stop it and do it with the right heart. Before you go to church, before you say, I want to serve as a deacon, I want to serve in the music ministry, I want to, before you do those things, stop it and make sure you're doing it for the glory of God. Or else, here's what you will find. You will miss out on the fullness of the joy of the Lord. Have any of you ever been in that religious rut? You're doing the right things, but you're exhausted. You're doing the right things, and yet you're empty. You're checking the boxes, and the boxes just seem like they don't mean anything. The reason is, is because we were never created to check boxes. We were created to have a relationship with the God of the universe. And we were created to bear his image to the lost world. I love what Jesus responds in verse 34. It says, when Jesus saw that he answered the life, he said to them, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared to question him any longer. That they, they tried to question him in a few different spells, and it just kept blowing up in their face. And, and I love what Jesus says, you're not far from it. Having this knowledge is good, but applying it to your life is better. Now you might say, why did you say that the point is to, to loving others as Jesus has loved you. Well, because Jesus actually says that in John 13, 34 through 35. He takes it a step further on the loving others as ourselves. John 13, 34 through 35 says this. I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. This is a new command. Love others not the way that you were going to love. Even more than that, as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. And don't miss verse 35. By this, everyone will know you are all the disciples if you love one another. Not if you have the right Bible translation. Not if you sing the right kind of songs, the right genre. Not if you go to the right denomination of church. Not if you have the most Bible verses memorized. He says that the world will know you are my disciples by how you love one another. Church, I don't see it too much in this. I, I, I've seen us grow a lot in this area. But let me just remind you, we are to love every That Christ died for you when you were in the pit. That Christ died for you knowing all the horrible things you were going to do. We have got to stop condemning homosexuals. We've got to stop hating on all these people who do all these fleshly things and making them feel like they're, be they're below dirt. We're not to compromise on what the Bible says. Make no mistake about that. But we're to love those people where they are and tell them that there is hope in Christ. 
And we're not going to say, and then you can get rid of your homosexuality, or then you can get rid of your drug addiction, or then you can get rid of it. No, what we do is we say, if you want hope, if you want the answer, the answer is repent and believe. The answer is confess your sins. The answer is call upon Jesus to save you, and he'll save you. And then over time, he's going to work out the rest in your life. He's going to sanctify you throughout your rest of your life into his image. I, I cannot stress this enough. Praise God, hallelujah, that every morning that I pray, that God does not flood me with everything that is wrong with me currently. Because if he did, I would not get up. I would be a puddle on the ground, and the reason is, is I would have no hope, because I would realize how wretched I am, and I would think to myself, there's no way out of this wretched. But God works on us one chip at a time, one block at a time. And then when we surrender that to him, he moves forward in us. We've got to make sure that we're loving the people out there who vote differently than us. The people out there who look differently than us, that listen to different music, that use a different Bible translation, that have bad theology but still know Jesus and remember what you were like when you had bad theology. We've got to love everyone as Christ has loved us. And how did he love us? He loved us to the point where he died on the cross for us. Amen? So recognizing that God is as powerful as he is should help put into perspective that no matter how big or small our mess is, it's not big enough to mess up God's plans. He is too powerful for that. So why should you want your home to be a home that is known for loving God above all else and loving others as Jesus has loved you? Well, here's the answer. Number two, you will experience I put experience in because I messed up. It happens. See, I'm human. It's okay. You will experience the fullness of God's Holy Spirit and the blessings that come from that fullness. Fullness, blessings, fullness, if you're filling it out. You will experience the fullness of God's Holy Spirit and the blessings that come from that fullness. So let's take a look at what God says to his people before telling them that they should focus their lives and their homes on loving him. Deuteronomy 6, 1-3 happens. A lot of times, the reason we get ourselves a message is because we take a Bible verse or a chunk of Bible and we say, look, this is what the Bible says, and we forget what it says before it or after it or what it says in its totality. And so here's what it says. This is the command, the statutes, and the ordinances. The Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, this is Moses speaking, so that you may follow them in the land you are about to enter and possess. Remember, this is an enslaved people who have been enslaved in idolatry for over 430 years. They're coming out of the promise, or they're coming out of the Egypt, and they're about to enter into the promised land, and God, speaking from Moses, is giving them the instructions so that they can know how to live a life and build a nation, to build a home. And it says, do this so that, say so that, you may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life. By keeping all of the statutes and commands I have given you, your son, your grandson, and so that you may have a long life. Listen, Israel, and be careful to follow them so that you may prosper and multiply greatly because the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you a land flowing with I don't mind if this is not your home. Though you will see it on television, you will see many people promise you all these things that you'll sow seed, that you'll do this. The things of this earth will fade away. They will rust. They will not last. Just think about what number of phone you're on <laughs> since you got your first smartphone. Think about how many shoes you have in your lifetime. Think about all of that. But what will last is the promise of the king that there is a land full of milk and honey. That heaven is true and it is promised to his children. The reason that we love him and others because we want what he wants for us. But Satan is so good, is he not? He's so good at tempting us and lying to us, and our flesh is very good at tricking us too. And we're like, oh, okay. And we go and we experience this pain, and we're like, why is this so painful? And God's like, because you went the wrong, you're building something else. Because man, if 
Satan and our flesh would just put a hook in front of us, we would never take hold of the hook, would we? Well, most of us wouldn't, right? We would be like, nah, I don't want that hook. But man, that shrimp on that hook, or that, that worm on that hook, man, we're like, oh, that's a good look. Oh, that's a good look. And then all of a sudden, ah! And we find ourselves missing out on the joy of our walk in Christ. As we're trying to build this home, we're going, why is this such a mess? It's because we got off course. The fullness is in Jesus and the promises that he's given us. Amen? Let's see what Jesus says will happen when we center our lives and homes in loving God and loving others. Our final passage, John 15, 9 through 11, says the following. If you want to ever know how to really get close to the Lord, John chapter 15, period talks to you about the joy of abiding in the vine, and he is that one. Alright? But John 15, 9 through 11. As the Father, God the Father, has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain. Abide in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. What are his commands? Love God with everything and love others. As he has loved us. If you will keep my commands, you will remain in my love. If you will focus your house, your home, your family on these two things, you will remain in his love. Just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. Who is our example? Jesus. Jesus is faithful and consistent to the Bible. Verse 11. I have told you these things so that, there's that so that, say so that, my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Who wants the joy of the Lord? And what we must do is focus our homes on loving God and loving others as He has loved us. Amen? Now, before doing any of that, we must all be settled on what and the why. Because if you're focused on it, and yet your spouse is focused on something else, I'm telling you right now, your home will be better because y'all both are focused on that something else, but it would be so much better if you were both focused on these two things. Your home will be better from you focusing on it, but it'll be so much better when y'all are all, when your children, when you children understand that you're not raising an athlete. You're not raising an academic achievement person. You're not raising a politician. You're raising a child of God. You're raising a son and a daughter of God. And when they have that perspective in mind, they will know what the family is all about. Does that mean they're going to be perfect? No. I know some of you think my children are perfect. They're not. Um, they're awesome. We love our boys. They're wonderful. I attribute it to the Word of God and the Spirit of God, but I'm telling you, there's no such thing as a perfect home, but there is a home that pleases the Lord, and it's a home that's focused on pleasing God, loving God, and loving others. So, what do I want you to do as Christians practically? The same thing I've been telling you every week since January is this, and I'm going to keep saying it again so that you remember that it wasn't just for a week, it's for the rest of your life. Focus on reading the Word of God every day, no matter what. And when you forget, or when you miss a day, pick up the next day. If you forget in the morning, pick it up when you remember. Do not let the Word of God leave you. Don't. Remember what he said, tie it around you, hold on to it, put it on your doorpost, all right? Read it with the purpose of knowing and loving God better and becoming more like Him. Read it with the purpose of God. I want to know you more intimately. I want to become more like you. When you open up your Bible like that, Leviticus looks different. When you open up your Bible like that, Job looks different. You're like, I get so lost in Leviticus and in Job. I'm, just like, oh. I'm telling you, man, when you realize the joy that is in the Word of God, it's amazing. Read your Word privately. Read it as a couple. Read it with your children. Pray with your married couple. Pray privately. Pray with your children. And then secondly, and here's where you've got to get to the point before you can start the build. You and your family must determine this week, 
whether or not you really want to build a Christian home, and if you're willing to build as God says to build. You've got to get on the same page. Because if you watch football, they're all trying to score on offense and on defense. They're trying to not let the other team score. What would happen if the offense was confused? Some thought you were supposed to score. Some thought you weren't supposed to score. What would happen? What would happen if the defense thought some, you know, oh, we got to stop them. The others like, oh, let it go, right? It would be a mess. Make sure you're on the same page. Make sure that you're building the way that the Lord intends for you. Next week, I'm going to be out of town. Brother Jimmy Potts is going to be sharing his testimony. Um, he's going to be sharing who he was before Christ, and how he came to know, and how he came to grow in Christ, and what his life is like today because of Christ. And so I invite everyone to come. Um, we're going to be videoing it, so I'm looking to catch it. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I'm really excited to see what God has in store for you all. I love you all. So how do we respond to this word today? It's actually very simple. We respond with a simple statement. Yes, Lord. Try it out. Yes. Try it again. Yes, Lord. Does it not feel good that when you don't know what to do, all you have to do is stop and say, yes, Lord. So what does yes, Lord mean? Well, if you are a Christian and you have not been growing and experiencing the fullness of your walk in Christ, it's because you've invited some things into your life that you shouldn't have or because you're neglecting things that you shouldn't be neglecting. And so what you need to do is simply say, Father, forgive me and restore me and show me what to take out and what to replace that with. And he will. All right? But you've got to do that. He's not going to make you. He's going to make you want to, but he's not going to make you do it. That's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. He makes us want to, but he doesn't force us. He allows us to choose him or not, even in our walks in Christ each day. If you're growing in your faith, I'm going to tell you every week, and there's a reason why. Stay home. Stay home. Don't look at those other people like that Pharisee did saying, oh, I'm so glad I'm not that person. You need to be beating your chest saying, oh, I'm so glad that I've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. I am unworthy, but so grateful for the reception of the gift that I have received. Stay home. If you don't know Christ, then what I would tell you is this. You cannot know him of your own accord. You cannot know him on your own. You have to understand that the Bible teaches that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, which means all of us were born with our sin separating us from God. But then secondly, not only has our sin separated us from God, but what also happened is, is that we couldn't do anything to clean ourselves up. We could remove our sin. The Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. And so you go, man, this is hopeless. No, it's not hopeless because there's a man named Jesus. Say his name. Jesus. At the cross, Jesus did for us what we couldn't undo for ourselves. John 1, 1, 7. He died on the cross. He shed his blood to pay for our sins. The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And the best news is this, that through faith, we freely receive the gift of eternal life. We freely receive from the Bible says the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. You say, how do I get that? Right here. It's so simple that if you will confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And one believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. If you want to be saved, nobody is in your way with you. For the many times that I heard the gospel and didn't respond, it was no one's fault but my own. So if you don't know Christ, if you're here, if you're watching online, if you don't know Jesus, <coughs> here's how to do that. Now there's a prayer, and you can say this prayer, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I want to be forgiven. I believe Jesus Christ, your son, died for my sins and is alive right now. I turn away from my sin. I confess Jesus as my Lord. I receive him in my life. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to lead my life. And I thank you for giving me eternal life. Leave that up there. You can say that prayer. Or you can just simply say, Jesus, save me, and he'll save you. 
Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior, and he'll do it. The prayer doesn't matter. It's the heart that's praying. So what I want to do is I want to invite everybody to bow your hands. We're going to pray, and then you can respond. You can respond in your pew. You can respond in your car. You can respond over here. You can come down and talk to me. You can respond. But here's what I will tell you is this, that once you've made a decision to give your life to Jesus, do not hide it. For the Bible says we should not be ashamed of our faith. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the privilege of having the knowledge that Jesus paid <coughs> my sin debt. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you for me not having to be good enough to be saved. Thank you for making me not have to come to you and it's that you sent your son to come down to us. I pray, Lord, for those who do not know Christ that they will call upon him to save them today. I pray, Lord, for those who do know Christ that whatever the Holy Spirit inside of them is telling them they need to do, that they will simply respond, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen.